My name is Alan Gassman. I'm a uh, tax lawyer, a very geeky one as a matter of fact, in Clearwater, Florida. And oftentimes I'm accompanied by Brandon Ketrin in these presentations, but today is Oliver Ketrin's first birthday and his first birthday party. And anyone who has had a child remembers what it's like to have a one-year-old and how much it is, how much easier it is psychologically than having a 14-year-old. But in any event, most of my presentations, as you know, have been about estate tax planning and asset protection planning. So today I thought I would give us a break from creditor protection planning and asset protection planning and just talk about the Beatles all day. No, actually not that. I wanna talk about things that are more important than taxes, and that is taking care of yourself and taking care of your family. Now, as I page through here, uh, the presentation does not qualify for continuing education credit. No one would accredit this type of program, no matter how much we asked. And within three to five hours after the presentation, you will receive an email of the recording and the PowerPoint slides so that you can send them to everyone you know. And if everyone sends this to five different people, then 12 people will receive it. Also, uh, if you have, oh, what's, com what's coming up? December 11th, we're gonna talk about key trust language and why it's important. December 18th, avoiding a state and trust litigation and beneficiary squabbles. And January 9th, how to make your office or business more effective and enjoyable. And I'm open to all of your suggestions with respect to that. Now, question, I am sorry, but we don't have time to answer questions. But in case we do, you could go to the question arrow and click on it. And then there's a space and you can go ahead and type in your question. And then towards the end of this presentation, at about 11.55 a.m. Eastern Standard Time today, I will attempt to answer your questions and to share your suggestions. Our YouTube channel has a lot of these presentations, almost all of the presentations, and a lot of charitable uh, presentations as well. Fun for everyone. Our Thursday report just came out on December 2nd. You can uh, let us know if you'd like a free subscription to the Thursday report. One of my favorite uh, presentations on the Thursday report this week is the, talking about the video that Jerry Hesh and I recorded about Phil Heckerling. Phil Heckerling probably did more for than anyone in the United States to advance estate planning in the United States by advancing the education of estate planners. He was a professor at the University of Miami. He started the University of Miami State Planning Institute, and today it's the largest institute for many good reasons. And Jerry Hesch was at his side for many, many of those years and has some very interesting stories to tell. So you can go to Article 4 and click on it and watch it, although I would recommend the Beatles instead. All right, let's go out. Let's stop the shameless self-promotion and get to a book that my wife, Marsha, bought me, You Are Not So Smart. Please remember that there is psychology in dealing with people, believe it or not. About half of you are estate planners and about half of you watching this with us today get estate planning done or you're thinking about getting estate planning done. I know a lot of you got estate planning done. Well, we are, believe it or not, emotional human beings. So you sometimes have to ask yourself or your client, why didn't you get this done before? Why are you making these decisions? Have you really thought it through? And how can I help you by being a good listener? Because it, it's very important when you're planning somebody's estate, if you're going to do a good job for their family, you have to understand where they're coming from. 
And sometimes we have, believe it or not, limiting beliefs and misconceptions about how the world works. So if you can help your clients handle the misconceptions, then things can be better for everybody. So from a simple point of view, I wanna give you some checklist items. The first thing is, have you thought through incapacity? Assuming that you're not incapacitated now, and I know many of you might be, have you got a durable power of attorney in place, naming somebody who can truly and will truly come to your aid if there's ever a terrible problem? So that is the durable power of attorney. And if you are a Floridian, it cannot be springing or it will not be enforceable if it's signed after 2010. So if you go to a form book which says this power of attorney will only apply if I'm incapacitated and you sign it, then it will never apply if you are a Floridian. So watch out for that. Then we've talked maybe ad nauseum about protecting assets from creditor claims, but are they protected from creditor claims? And if this is a moderate family, not a wealthy family, but what I call a moderate family, then what is the situation for getting people onto Medicaid if they cannot pay for their own nursing expenses? Okay, so what about probate? What is probate? Probate is the process where if a person dies with assets in their personal name, to get those assets out of their name into the name of the beneficiaries under their will, you have to show a judge in the probate court that all the liabilities have been paid, that all the taxes have been paid, that there's a will, here's what it says, we've given notice to all the beneficiaries and anyone who's an interested party, nobody's complained, Here's what, we, here's what we've got. We have a bond in place to make sure that the personal representative appointed, if they steal, the bonding company's responsible. That's a lot of red tape. It is not $100,000 worth of red tape. It's usually three to $5,000 worth of red tape. So assuming that you've appointed a personal representative and a trustee who are going to make sure that the law firm charges an hourly rate, and not a percentage. It is just not the end of the world, but it's better to avoid if you can. So part of the conversation with the estate planner should be on death, which assets will go through probate, what does this cost, what are the advantages and disadvantages of going through probate, should I establish a revocable trust so that my bank account, instead of being in my name, is in the name of my trust, and on my death, my wife can take that death certificate to the bank with a copy of my trust and say, hey, I'm Marsha, Alan's gone, I'm the trustee now, no need for probate, thank you very much. That would be an example of probate avoidance. But to spend a lot of money and lose creditor protection because you wanna avoid probate is not a good decision. And people confuse probate with creditor protection. They confuse it with Medicaid protection. So uh, it's important to go ahead and get educated on these types of things. Now, a big mistake that we talk about all the time is, am I going to leave assets directly to people or am I going to leave assets in trust for people? And if you've watched any of my videos, you know our preference is leave it in trust. Here's the reasons. Number one, creditors of the beneficiary can't reach it if it's a properly drafted trust. Number two, can't lose it in a divorce. Number three, not subject to estate tax when the beneficiary dies in most cases. Number four, if the beneficiary is a goofball, let them be co-trustee with their choice of any trust company or some responsible person named in the trust agreement so they don't gamble it away, get ripped off, 
or spend it in silly ways. So we strongly recommend that you consider leaving assets in trust. And if you have an inheritance coming to you, that could well be a mistake. And you could go to my Forbes blog and search Gasman Forbes Inheritance Trust and get uh, some articles on that. And if you could click on that 10,000 times, then I will make $10 and very much appreciate it. Okay, so that is the protective trust or also known the, as the inheritance trust. For the lawyers out there, the inheritance trust uh, is, is a great series of articles by, by Steve Oceans, uh, O-S-H-I-N-S. If you go to his website and look up the inheritance trust, he and his father, Richard Oceans, have uh, done a great job explaining how that works. Now, failure to avoid the estate tax, and you can see when we did these slides back when I was in my 50s, the estate tax exemption was 5,450,000 in 2016, and that was a great improvement from a million dollar estate tax exemption not too long before, the, before that. So now, questions for the estate planning lawyer. And the first question is, are you doing a good estate plan? You know, I know that sometimes clients will tame us for bad habits. And the example is, you see five clients, and three of them are all ears. They want to know all they can. They are willing to pay for the time it takes, and they're happy. One of them is fee conscious and wants you to spend limited time. Uh, he or she already read about it all on Wikipedia and would like to keep the cost down. And then the fifth one is just impossible. So now the, you come out of those five experiences and you go into number six. And because of the two bad experiences, you assume that client number six only wants half an hour of time, doesn't want to know everything, and wants to keep the price down. But the majority of clients may want to have full information and a thorough estate plan. So how you address that psychologically and in your business model is up to you. For our firm, the preference would be that those first two folks, we want to help them by referring them to another law firm that may have a different business model than our law firm. So I don't know about you, but I really respect my dentist. I really respect my doctor. When I go to my dentist or my doctor, I'm polite. I listen well. I take notes, I compliment them, and I pay my bill on the way out. You know, that's what most smart business people do with their estate and trust lawyers. And that's a pretty good strategy. And then the other question to ask your estate and trust lawyer is what would you do if you were me and you were doing this conscientiously? So, a lot of these questions that should be considered or thought about or explained are brushed aside because someone's in a hurry or fee consciousness or whatever it is. It's a good idea to get along with people and take them through these items and these issues and make sure that the important stuff is covered and that the unimportant stuff is not covered. I mean, a lot of people, quite candidly, even in the tens and tens of millions, will call and say, well, I'm going on vacation and can I sign a will tomorrow? I haven't bothered to do anything and I'm 79 years old and I'm getting a little bit concerned about this flight that I'm going to be on. And we do our best for those people, but hopefully you come back later and, and do uh, the right job. So a lot of pages here. And here are some things that 
we like to talk to clients about number one, what are your personal items and why are they important and how will they be distributed? And one thing I've learned about over the years about the personal items is the personal items often start the fights between the descendants. They start fighting over, well, grandma promised me the vase. Well, she promised me the vase. Well, guess what, everybody? Grandmas do that all the time. They promise the same thing to six different people. And then all six of the different people think that the other people manipulated grandma. Grandma manipulated everybody. Blame her, not each other. But if you are that grandma, try to be very specific about where you want things to go so that people don't argue about it and either name a King Solomon who's gonna divide it up and they could be mad at King Solomon, not each other, or some sort of a lottery technique. It's the personal items are very important to people and children and grandchildren don't even normally know what those personal items are. So asking grandma to make a videotape explaining the importance of her personal items and why she wants them to go to certain people can be important. Page 32, liquidity. Believe it or not, some clients die and an estate tax or other items come due. The bank calls the loan and the spouse or children don't have enough cash to even run the estate. Worse yet, they can't afford their lawyer. That's terrible. So please at least give a little bit of thought to how much cash will be needed if I die? Will the bank call the loan? Will my spouse be able to afford to live in the mansion? See, a lot of times clients come to us, married couples, and one spouse makes all the decisions and the other spouse goes along and that's all good and well, until the decision-making spouse dies. So one of the things I try to do in an estate planning conference is I ask the decision-making spouse, if you die, is there enough cash? Okay, well, how will we raise some cash? Do you suggest that we sell the business or that we keep the business? Who can we trust who works in the business to manage it? Who is not trustworthy? Who outside of the business can help us understand how to keep it running and how to sell it? What are your suggestions for the stock and bond portfolio? Should we hire to run the stock and bond portfolio if you die? And then a, a little bit of a sad one for me is, you realize that if you die and the investments are invested at 4% a year that your spouse cannot afford to stay in the mansion. Do you recommend that the mansion be sold in that situation? And the other spouse needs to hear that conversation to not be in a state of shock or think that they're gonna be able to keep the mansion too long. So asking the cash question is important and oftentimes it's solved simply by buying inexpensive term life insurance. Now this may just kick the can 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, but for many people, just adding a inexpensive term life insurance policy so the mortgage on the mansion can get paid and there can be an extra couple of million around to pay the property taxes and insurance on the mansion so that the surviving spouse doesn't have to sell it right away that can be very important. That goes to the minimum needs and objectives. Are you going to leave enough to go around and how will this be decided? I am not a financial planner. I don't have credentials to be a financial planner and therefore I can say anything I want. And I have some opinions and I share my opinions. And I do have a 4% rule. I say, Floyd, when you die, if we have a million dollars of investments, then most likely Nancy can spend $40,000 a year, pretty much the rest of her life. If it's okay with you, if it goes into a conventional stock and bond portfolio, is that okay? 
Floyd may say, yeah, that's fine. And I realize 40,000 a year is not enough for Nancy. I'll go get a couple of million of term life insurance. And maybe we can even consider saving instead of spending everything I earn. So that by the time 20 years goes by, I won't need that life insurance anymore. Or Floyd may say, no, I'm afraid of the stock market. Everything needs to stay in bonds. Well, if everything needs to stay in bonds, then Nancy better be able to live on 2%. So those, those things need to be thought out and described because otherwise when Floyd dies, if he's the leader and Nancy's the follower, who is Nancy going to follow? There's going to be a hundred opinions and she may find the worst one. So to try to talk through, here's what happens in the event of death or incapacity of Floyd. Here are the decisions that Floyd recommends. That gives Nancy an important pathway of what might be done and who might be trusted and who not to trust when uh, things hit the fan. So that goes to also page 35 here. How do you feel about these various investments so that the survivor can do well with them and in the conversation, it's fine to give an opinion. My opinion is I've been in a conventional stock and bond portfolio for 35 years. It's average seven, seven and a half percent. Anytime it's gone down, it's come back up within five to six years. You can never try to time the market. People who try to time the market and get in and out on the right time normally have a 2% rate of return. Those of us who just stay in the market, average of seven, seven and a half percent rate of return. Those types of things, these annuities, a lot of investment advisors sell you annuities that purport to give you a guaranteed income of all your principal. They don't really do that. The sales language in the portfolio, in the pamphlets is, in my opinion, very misleading. They generate large commissions for the people who sell them, certain types of annuities, life insurance. Many people don't need permanent life insurance, but then the agents are sold or earn much more if they sell permanent life insurance. All that stuff is going on. And an experienced estate planner should know enough about these things to try to help our clients, try to treat our clients as if they were friends and family. Because if your clients don't feel like friends and family, then I would say that maybe something's wrong in the approach that you are using. These are actual people that you're trying to help and families that you're trying to help. They are not just money, although it's a good thing that to some extent they are money. Now, Page 37, time bomb, the beneficiary designations. I draft the most beautiful trust agreement and a will that pours everything into the trust agreement. And that trust agreement would take care of everyone beautifully. And then I fill out the beneficiary designation forms. So the life insurance and the annuities go the right places at the right times. And the IRAs go the right places at the right times. And then the client switches brokers and the new broker changes everything without asking me. And then the client dies and everything goes to the wrong places. This happens over and over and over again. And quite candidly, as many times as I try to explain this to clients, as many letters as you write, as many memos as you give them, they can and often will flub it up. So if you're a layman listening here, make sure you ask for instructions. Where does my IRA go? Commonly, it's payable to your spouse with the alternate being a trust. Yes, it can go to a trust for your children, and it doesn't have to come up until out until the 11th year after your calendar year of death if the trust is properly drafted. If the trust is improperly drafted, 
it would have to come out within five years. But if it goes to your spouse, your spouse can roll it over. Doesn't even need to come out until after your spouse reaches age 72. So all these things are important to think about, not only from the tax end of it, but from the practical end of it. And section I here on page 37, we see this a lot. The client has a well-drafted, well, I'm going to say fairly well-drafted revocable trust. And the revocable trust says, on my death, hold everything for the health, education, and maintenance of my spouse. And on my spouse's death, transfer everything to or for the benefit of my children. But then when you read the language of the trust, it may say, give all income to my spouse. Well, I don't wanna have to give the income to your spouse. That may cause creditors to be able to reach it. I'd rather the trustee only distribute what the spouse needs. And then there's a common clause. The spouse can withdraw the greater of $5,000 or 5% a year, whether they need it or not. Well, then your creditors are going to draw that out. I don't like that 5-5 clause. And then they forget to put in the provision that says when my spouse dies, he or she can redirect where it goes as among our descendants, limited to our descendants. You know, if one child is estranged from you and treating you terribly, and another child is helping you and being very helpful, then you want to have that power of appointment. And you want to make sure it's drafted so it's not exercisable in favor of your estate, your creditors, or your your or creditors of your estate, so that it is not subject to creditor claims. And so it's not subject to estate tax. So the fact that you have a revocable trust or a will that establishes a trust for your spouse on the first death isn't enough. You have to open the hood and read it with a professional to make sure that it's doing what you want it to do. If you're in a second marriage situation and you've got children from each marriage involved, then plan to spend a lot more on your estate planning if you want to protect the children of the first marriage because they they are all treated like common children until one spouse dies, and then the children of the first dying spouse suddenly become black sheep of the family. For some reason, it's unexplainable, but it happens over and over again. And then often they inherit nothing unless the documents protect them. But how do you protect the children of the second marriage without letting the spouse have access because normally the surviving spouse is intended to be the better bene the the main beneficiary and then you get into the question of who should be the trustee should the spouse be the trustee if the spouse turns 85 and breaks the spouse's hip and the most aggressive child shows up at the house and says oh let me help you just sign here you know, this is what we see over and over. So thinking through what happens on a death, who is the trustee, even if I'm going to be the sole trustee at what age or in what circumstances should I be required to have a co-trustee, if I can exercise a power of appointment, should I ever be able to exercise it in a way that would allow a descendant of ours to receive more than what they reasonably need for health education and maintenance? Should there be a charitable provision so that something can go to charity? All of these things are very important. What most of our clients come out with, and of course I admit this is partly from my influence, is a trust where the surviving spouse is co-trustee, his or her choice, of any trust company in the United States, any person specifically named in the trust document, maybe any board certified trust and estate lawyer or a CPA that's done work for the family at least 10 years, but someone as co-trustee. So when the spouse remarries, 
They can tell their new spouse, I am very sorry, but my co-trustee will not allow me to bail out your child's restaurant to buy you a Jaguar or to take you to Paris and spend $100,000. My trustee just won't allow me to do that. I would love to do that, but my trustee won't allow me to do that. Let's use your money for that. So these are the types of things, because think about it, if you, what's the difference between being sole trustee and being co-trustee with one of your children or your best friend? If they're not gonna let you do what you wanna do, maybe there's a reason for that. You could fire them, go to somebody else on the list, but we do strongly recommend a co-trusteeship. Also for responsible adult children. Responsible adult children don't mind having a co-trustee because they know they may need that co-trustee if there's a nasty divorce or a health problem. And someday your child will also be an 85 year old person who may have a broken hip and an aggressive child or in-law or nursemaid. If you wanna be a, mil a millionaire in Pinellas County, Florida, if that is your goal to be a millionaire in Pinellas County, Florida, then my best recommendation is that you become a housekeeper in a condominium community limited to people 55 years or older and that you be such a good housekeeper that you're handling 10 to 12 elderly people's cleaning so that you can determine which one has dementia and will fall in love with you and marry you yep we see that all the time i've seen people who have been at the bedside of the person they took care of and inherit all of that person's assets four times one person oh let me come and help you and i'll clean your prop i'll clean your house oh your children are nasty to you let me take care of you oh my friend's a lawyer would you sign here so i can inherit your assets and then here I am at your deathbed. I'm so sorry to see you go. Thank you very much for the assets. So we are all potential victims to this type of conduct. It happened to Groucho Marx. It can happen to anyone. So that co-trusteeship, locking it up on in trust to try to protect it is a very, very um, good, important strategy so hopefully you'll print out this powerpoint and go ahead and take notes so that when you meet with a lawyer or other advisor you've had some thought um put put into this situation now uh loss of inheritance to divorce if i die and i leave a trust for my daughter and she's the trustee, she gets what she needs for health education and maintenance, and then she gets in a nasty divorce. While her husband cannot reach into the trust or make a claim against the trust assets in most circumstances, he could claim that he should either receive alimony from her because she's very able to pay it, and the trust has helped to support them during their marriage, or that he should pay her less alimony because she has a trust. So oftentimes at the request of a client, our trust agreement will have a provision that says, if a child of mine is married, then the child will receive no more than $2,000 a month from any trust I leave and all of them combined, unless their spouse has agreed one, to never make a claim against the trust or any inherited assets. Two, to never claim that alimony should be more or less because of the trust. Now, if the spouse signs that, you know you've got a nice spouse. If the spouse doesn't sign it, then you're limited to 2000 bucks a month getting out of the trust. And you know a little bit more about your spouse. A lot of clients ask me, should my children get a prenuptial agreement before they get married? 
And quite often when it's a young marriage or a first marriage for both spouses, it's not a great idea to make your new spouse sign everything away. For one thing, it can cause a lot of resentment. And for another thing, it may not be fair. You know, I once had a beneficiary say, you know, quite candidly, his parents have spoiled him so much and he has so much wealth that he's going to sit there and be a couch potato and watch TV and eat potato chips and not be able to pay me alimony. And you want me to waive my rights to this trust so I end up being the worker in the family and then I have to pay him alimony even though he has a multi-million dollar trust. So that is a little bit of resentment there and a little bit of disbalance. But to ask that the person will not make a claim against an inheritance and will not claim the alimony or the uh, alimony because of the inheritance, and to also ask that any divorce will be under confidential arbitration and not be in the public record, that is not unusual. I don't think it is overreaching, but you do have to be gentle or you may never be able to interact with your grandchildren, which is an important consideration. Now, page 41, you've been so busy doing slats and estate tax calculations and all that stuff that we haven't really said, is there a buy-sell agreement in the business. You and your brother are partners. You own 49%, your brother owns 51%. Oop, it'd be horrific. He could fire you, he could just pay himself a big salary and leave nothing for dividends. If it's an S corporation or a partnership entity, you could pay tax on the income that you don't get. So there should be a buy-sell agreement. And if it's a buy-sell agreement among family members, but it re reflects the low end of what arm's length people would do, then that can help nail down the estate tax. And a lot of times what siblings will do when they own a business together, if they're speaking to each other, is they'll buy life insurance, have the company finance the life insurance, and then keep the value of the stock really low. So the life insurance is in a life insurance trust for my spouse, and when I die, my, my stock goes at a very low price to my brother. So there's not much estate tax on the stock, but the company has financed a life insurance policy so that my spouse is plenty happy that I died because she got all the benefit of that life insurance. So that, that could be a more efficient way to do it. But we find that a lot of very successful entrepreneurs will go into business with friends or associates, and the agreement is all about what to do with the profits and all about what to do when it goes public and all about all the good stuff, but not so much about the bad stuff. What if you leave and compete against the business? What if you turn into a blithering idiot? What if you die, what do we have to pay you? So dust off the buy-sell agreements, take a look at them, Sometimes they'll cause loss of the S corporation qualifications. So many, many things to uh, think about. Another thing we want to think about is how are the assets situated? How are the liabilities situated? Are liabilities within companies that shield the liabilities from the important assets? That goes into asset protection planning, which I told you I would not spend a lot of time on here. The CPA in the loop, or do you have a CPA who's looped? When I started practicing 37 years ago, the most successful CPAs spent a lot of time with their clients. They knew their clients like friends and like uncles and they advised their clients, they looked through financial statements with their clients, they looked through tax returns, they went to weddings, they went to bar mitzvahs, and they cared and they gave great advice. 
let's face it, there's fewer of them out there now. Right now, the bigger model or the more common model is let me get your return and statements done on time. And it was great talking to you. There are still CPAs out there who look beyond the financial statement and beyond the tax return. They look to the client. They look to the business of the client's entities. They look to the insurance. They look to protect the client. Make sure your CPA knows that that's what you want. CPAs have the same pressure that lawyers have, where I talked about the five clients. Three want everything. Two are cost conscious, so the lawyer is trained to think that all five are cost conscious. Let your CPA know that you would love to have a long talk. Go over these sheets with the CPA. Tell them you're more than glad to pay for the time and the consultation to get some extra help. If the CPA is not comfortable with that, see who they might recommend as a business advisor. Keep the CPA completely separate and apart from your investments. The CPA should be an independent advisor and should not be getting commissions to sell you investments. Most CPAs won't do that. Many accountants are not CPAs and do not have to comply with the many, many requirements that a CPA has to comply with. It may take only two or three days to become an enrolled agent. And to be an accountant in the state of Florida, all you have to do is get an occupational license that says the word accountant. There's no training needed whatsoever to hold yourself out as an accountant. So Stay with a certified public accountant, a reputable certified public accountant, one that has many clients in your community or that you know of to make sure that they care and that they're doing the, the right job. Okay, the will and trust documents, I've already mentioned, I think everything you see here on page 45, by the way, do you know where they are and are they signed? You know, we've had situations where we've sent clients draft documents, six reminder letters, finally a termination letter, and then five to seven years later, the client calls and says, I need a copy of my will and trust. Well, I'm sorry, Floyd, but I sent you drafts and then I sent you six reminder letters and then I fired you. Oh, you did? I thought we signed them. No, you didn't sign them. So make sure that you have signed estate planning documents in place that are coordinated with your beneficiary designations. If you're not up to doing that, and I agree it's drudgery, have somebody check that every two or three years. From an asset protection standpoint, sit down with the lawyer. Tell me what on my chart is creditor protected and what's not and where I need to move it so that it is creditor protected. Have any of the rules changed since we did that planning? Again, with the business or the investments, what happens if you die? Who handles that uh, situation? Now, the estate tax planning goes hand in hand with all that. And if you remember watching Mr. Spock play three-dimensional chess, that's what it's like when you do estate tax planning, asset protection planning, and family planning all at the same time. It's actually a lot of fun, but it needs to be done by somebody who really knows how to do it. So if your lawyer is not an estate tax specialist, and you have an estate tax issue, ask your lawyer to bring in an estate tax specialist that he or she is comfortable with and make sure that that gets done. Most CPAs know something about estate tax planning, but they normally do not have a thorough education in how a slat or an installment sale 
or certain other techniques work. So ask your CPA or ask your lawyer who they can bring in to help with that. Now I have a new chart here, so I'm so excited on page 52. This client called and said, how should I own my brokerage accounts? And I gave her some choices. One choice is they live in Florida, so they can own the brokerage accounts as tenants by the entireties. But then if somebody sues both of them, they can be lost. Or if one spouse dies and the other spouse is living, there's no probate, but they would become subject to creditor claims. So if Fred is a, is a brain surgeon and Wilma's a soccer coach, we could put a revocable trust under Wilma to avoid probate, and we could put those investments under Wilma's revocable trust. But then if Wilma gets sued, the creditors can reach into the revocable trust because it avoids probate, but not creditors. Set up an LLC, also known as a limited liability company, and have it owned 40% TBE, 40% by Wilma, 20% for a by a trust for the children. Here's the advantages. The trust for the children can't be touched by creditors and can be used to educate the children, and you're going to have to do that anyway, so why not set aside what you're going to need for education? Secondly, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If Wilma dies first, she wants those assets protected from Fred's next spouse. So she would like to put a lot of net worth under her revocable trust. But she's driving the children to soccer practice and all that. She might get in an accident and lose it all. So the LLC could be owned 40% by her revocable trust, which blocks up on her death, and 40% by uh, as tenants by the entireties so that on the uh, first death, only 40% is exposed as owned by the surviving spouse, which is Fred, the neurosurgeon. One of the points I make here is that clients need the ability to understand the choices that we are giving them. And this illustration and the letter I wrote to these clients on page 53, 54, and 55, which went out this week, explained it to them, both visually and I explained it to them auditorily. And then I sent them this chart. And because they are such fans of the Flintstones, they decided to go forward with the LLC. Now, someone asked me to talk about confidentiality. And these clients did not want someone to be able to look at the Florida Secretary of State website to see that they have a company or the Pinellas County Property Appraiser website to see where they live. And more and more people feel that way, that privacy is important. So this LLC could be formed and maintained in Wyoming, Colorado, Delaware, or one of the other states that does not disclose ownership or management. Or if this LLC is a Florida LLC, and maybe it owns rental real estate, so it has to be registered with Florida, I can make the manager of this LLC a Wyoming LLC. So when people go to the website and they see this Florida LLC, they don't see who's the manager. They see a Wyoming company's the manager, they go to the Wyoming Secretary of State, and all they see is cactuses because Wyoming doesn't tell you who the manager or the owner is. And I could set up the Wilma Flintstone Revocable Trust, and I could have the trustee of that trust be a Wyoming LLC, and then I could put the homestead under that trust. I could still have the homestead exemption, still have creditor protection, but when someone looks up Fred and Wilma, where do they live in the Pinellas County property appraiser, their names don't come up. When someone checks out where, if, some, if their neighbors look, the neighbors see that the, uh, 
property is in the ABC Revocable Trust, managed by ABC LLC, a Wyoming LLC. So they don't see the client's name. And then even if the client's homestead there, the property appraiser will give the homestead exemption without disclosing the client's name on the uh, property appraiser website. They are very cooperative with respect to that. Now I'll tell you one trick of the trade. Uh, many, well, not many. I have found a handful of counties which have a, a box on the property appraiser website. It's usually like 20 characters, 20 letters long, and it gives the names of the people who are qualified for the homestead exemption. So it normally, it normally says John and Mary Smith. So I made the trustee of the trust, the ABC LLC, but they were still gonna put John and Mary Smith there because they qualified for the, they're the ones who were the qualifiers for the homestead tax exemption. So I said, would you put in Alan S. Gassman as agent for John and Mary Smith? And they said, why is that? And I said, because the first 20 characters of that are Alan S. Gassman as agent or period. So now when people search that particular county, all they see is my name. I'm not gonna tell them who I'm the agent for. And when they search my client's name in the county where my client practices medicine, they're not going to be able to find that. So that's a little bit about confidentiality. Now we also use land trust for confidentiality. But all these things do not save taxes. It used to be that there were all these seminars in Las Vegas where because of Nevada confidentiality, you were gonna not have to pay taxes. That dog doesn't hunt. That's like a go to jail type of thing. So uh, be careful in that area. Okay, let's see what else we have, what other goodies we have here. All right, I wanna talk, I've got seven minutes left, so let me first do some questions and answers. And by the way, at the, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna play a videotape that I uh, recorded at Stetson Law School about three years ago with uh, Professor Srikumar Rao, who had been at Columbia University, to talk, and it was a uh, six hour workshop that we gave for estate planners. And just a little bit about attitude um, that we discussed. And Srikumar is brilliant. You can go on YouTube and see his TED Talk, T-E-D Talk, T-A-L-K, read his books. Just a very fascinating guy. So I had a lot of good feedback from another video I showed, I think, two or three weeks ago for you from Srikumar. So you might enjoy that. It's going to be up in about five minutes. Okay, let's see if there are any questions or answers. Okay, this is from Cameron. Are the intentionally defective grantor trusts legitimate and do they work? The answer is yes. I can set up an irrevocable trust that's outside of my estate for estate tax purposes, immune from my creditor claims if I'm not a beneficiary or if it's in a certain asset protection jurisdiction yet the trust is disregarded for income tax purposes, so all of its income and deductions go on my personal return. Those are described in our tax planning videos, and yes, Cameron, they do work. Okay, this is from Ian. If a married couple own their primary residence as tenants in common, they split the asset to maximize use of their estate tax exemptions, how can you avoid probate? Well, the first thing I want to mention is you can't split the house up and have it pass to a trust on the first death if there's a minor child. So you have to make sure you don't have minor children involved. If a husband and wife want to have each own half of the house and pass that half to a trust on the first death, then they all, there also needs to be an appropriate waiver of homestead inheritance rights, which probably needs to be signed before the first death. And then the question is, how can you avoid probate on the asset? Well, you could title the home under the revocable trust, 
or you could use a ladybird deed which says on my death the home my half of the home goes to my trust but technically in florida homestead doesn't go by probate homestead goes by act of law so normally we don't file a probate to move the homestead we file a separate action called a, a petition to determine homestead it's really really complicated so that's just a uh, bird's eye view okay from nicole can you structure one testamentary trust for each grown child giving the child full control of the assets, naming the beneficiaries, letting them be co-trustee, to, to receive assets from more than one living trust from both parents? And the answer, yes, Nicole, we can do all those things. You know, when people say, can you do this with a trust? The answer usually is, I can do anything you want with a trust, just tell me what it is, and the trust law can be very flexible. Now, Nicole used a word, testamentary trust, that's a trust that opens up under your will. So as opposed to having a revocable trust that lives as soon as I sign it, a testamentary trust, my will says on my death, move my probate assets into the trust that formed under this last will and testament. And normally they have to go through probate in order to have that happen. So a will that opens up a trust at death by the terms of the will usually does not avoid probate just so you know. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions here. Um, okay, Juan, I am a resident of Pennsylvania. Can you recommend a lawyer in Pennsylvania? Yes, I will get back with you on that. Okay, do many of your clients use investments available only to accredited investors as opposed to the stock market? Stephen, that's a great question. I don't think so. I think most of my clients uh, even clients with, uh, you know, $300 million uh, investment accounts are in the same sorts of Schwab investment accounts uh, managed by fee-for-service investment advisors the same way that somebody with $2 million has. So we don't see a lot of accredited, I don't see a lot of accredited investor type of arrangements. Okay, in what other states can brokerage accounts be held as tenants by the entireties? Well, Molly, not in Texas where you're from, but Pennsylvania, Delaware, Florida, and Wyoming are most of the states that'll, that give you not only tenancy by the entireties for accounts, but also creditor protection for accounts. And let me mention that a, a big holder of accounts is USAA, which is in Texas, and a married couple in Florida that opens a USAA account, even if we title it Allen and Marcia Gassman TBE account, is not a tenancy by the entireties account. It's not creditor protected because the USAA account agreement specifically says that it's not. Okay. Um, then Molly asks, can you recommend a lawyer in Dallas? I recommend Andy Chow, S-C-H-O-U, who is a lawyer and CPA, but he practices as a lawyer in Dallas. And he and I are about to do a webinar series on planning for Korean Americans. And we're gonna talk about, first of all, we're gonna explain estate planning in Korean. I'm excited about that. And then we're going to talk about for lawyers and accountants, how the Korean law system works, because a lot of Korean American clients have assets in Korea. We're gonna talk about customs and, and assumptions that Korean American clients typically have. And we're gonna, I'm gonna work with Marty Shankman, and we're gonna do that for a number of nationalities. So if you know of an estate planning professional who has a practice in a particular nationality or niche, that would have to do with that, we'll be glad to meet them and do a webinar with them. Okay, then uh, a lot of you are asking for recommendations of lawyers outside of Florida, so I will go ahead and respond to that. And my time is up. Let me see if there was one more thing. So I think in a week or two, I'm coming back and we're gonna talk about avoiding litigation 
in estate planning because in every city in the United States, there's a dozen or more lawyers who spend more than 70% of the entire time in trust and estate litigation. And when we talk about how to avoid trust and estate litigation, we'll be talking about more practical things that you can add to an estate plan. Those of you who have joined us today, thank you very much. You have our, my email address, agassman at gassmanpa.com. I welcome your questions, comments, and suggestions and the opportunity to provide information and to organize our materials. And here we go, Srikumar Rao. So mental chatter is not an enemy. Don't go around, and by the way, a lot of the mental chatter is you beating up on yourself. In my full program, and by the way, I'm starting a new program in February, uh, on February 24th. So if any of you are interested, talk to me about it later. The first exercise you do is a mental chatter exercise where you record what the hell is going on between your ears. And you'll be surprised how many times it is destructive. Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. Why did I do that? I'm never going to amount to anything. I have no willpower. And there are all these other people who are so much more talented, who are so much better looking, and they weigh less, and their suit, and their dresses fit them. And you know, why am I like this? And I'm always doing stuff that I shouldn't have. And you're passing judgment on others. You, you'll be surprised at the crap you're carrying around inside your ears and you act on a regular basis. You keep doing it because you don't even notice it. When you start noticing it, you'll find out how much there is of it. You'll also find out that how you experience life is entirely a function of the stories that you tell yourself. Understand you can't eliminate mental chatter. It is there, it's not going to go away. Mental chatter is not the enemy, it exists. It is what it is. What you have to learn to do is recognize that it is or can be a tool. You utilize that tool carefully. And boy, you'll find that your mental chatter will get you to all kinds of good places as opposed to dragging you off to places that you don't want to go. It's entirely a function of, you know, I told you earlier that your awareness is like a flashlight and it lights up whatever you shine it on, you're gonna learn how to use that flashlight to shine it on what you need to shine. So when you change the stories you tell about yourself and to yourself, you'll find it makes a huge, huge, huge difference in your life. Okay? Back to you, Alan. What's the first question for Sri Kumar? <laughs> Yes. Would you consider it to be a logical extension of that, the concept of projection, all that inner, inner conversation, inner dialogue that you throw on other people so you get angry at them yes. when it's really your own issue? Absolutely. 100% yes. Thank you. It is your own issue and you do project it onto others. We do it all the time. Good. I'm glad you recognize that, but yes. That's a good question. Srikumar, why don't you talk about your concept of a good thing versus a bad thing? Talk in a way. There's something that we do, and we do it multiple times every day, and it's extraordinarily deleterious to our well-being, and we don't even recognize that we're doing it. And what it is that we do is the moment something happens, we stick a label on it. And in our label, we decide this is a good thing or this is a bad thing. Think about that. Even something which is very trivial. You know, your spouse calls, calls you and says, your in-laws are going to come for dinner on Friday. This is bad. They're going to stay for the weekend. This is really bad. Right? No matter what happens in your head, there's nothing neutral. It's either partly good or partly bad. Right? Okay. So I want to share a story with you. Uh, there are many versions of this story, but it's a Sufi story, and I like the version I'm about to share with you. There was a man and his son, and they lived in a beautiful valley, 
and they were very happy, they were also dirt poor. And the man got tired of being dirt poor and he said, you know, I'm going to get rich. And he turned entrepreneurial and he was going to get rich by breeding horses, so he bought a stallion. Did not have money to buy the stallion, so he borrowed very heavily from the neighbors. And the very day he got the stallion, it kicked the top bar loose from the paddock where he housed it and ran away. And the neighbors ran around and they said, you know, you were going to become a rich man, but your stallion has run away and you still owe us money, you are screwed. So he shrugged his shoulders and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows. That stallion fell in with a group of wild horses, and he was able to entice them into the paddock, which he had repaired, so escape was no longer possible. So now he had a stallion back plus a dozen wild horses, which by the status of that village made him a wealthy man. And the neighbors ran around saying, gee, we thought you were broke and you know, fortune has smiled on you. You are now actually a rich man. And he shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? The man and his son started to break the horses so they could sell them on the market. And one of the horses threw the man's son and stomped on his leg, and it broke and it heaved crooked. And they came around commiserating. He was such a fine young lad, and now he'll never be able to find a girl to marry him. And he shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? And that summer, the king of the country declared war on a neighboring country, and press gangs moved to the villages, rounding up all the able-bodied young men. But they spared this man's son because he had a game leg. And the neighbors had tears in their eyes and said, we don't know if we'll ever see our sons alive, but you still have your son. How fortunate you are. And he shrugged his shoulders and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? And it goes on like that forever. And the reason I invite you to think about this story is I want you to go back in your own life and consider, did anything ever happen to you which at the time it happened, you thought this was terrible? But now you can look back upon it and say, hey, this was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Can you think of that? Mm -hmm. So all of you have had experience of at least one thing that happened to you that at the time that uh, it happened, you thought was terrible. But you can now look back and say, this was great. So given that, is there the slightest possibility that what you are today about to label this is bad? Is there the slightest possibility that X years from now, it could turn out to be pretty good. And if there is the slightest possibility that it could turn out to be good, why are you in a hurry to label it bad? Because the moment you label it bad, that is the instant at which suffering begins. Think about that. Suffering doesn't begin when something happens to you. Suffering begins at the instant you take what happened to you and say, this is terrible, this is unbearable, this is bad. And the moment you say this is bad, at that instant, suffering begins. So what happens if you don't label it bad? Guess what? Suffering doesn't begin. And what happens if you then take the next step and say, is there anything that I can do to make this really good for me? And all of a sudden, you transport it to a different emotional domain, and avenues of action open up to you that would not even have occurred to you otherwise. Nothing will phase you. You will become not resilient, but you will become what I call extreme resilient. Because you will bounce up from anything so fast that others won't even know that you've been laid low. This is a learnable skill. I remember I was speaking to the uh, Global Leadership Conference in, uh, for the Entrepreneurs Organization at San Diego. And I was telling this talk, and there was someone in the audience who wouldn't be silent, raising his hand, press her up, press her up. I said, OK, hey. You know, and it turned out that he was actually from India. And he'd come to America, and he did his uh, master's degree from Stanford, and then he wanted to remain in America. So he joined a company, and he wasn't an H-1 visa, and he had reasonable chances of getting a transfer to a green card. But the company he joined 
failed. So all of a sudden, when he was running to the end of the H1, it expired, the company was no longer in business, and he could not remain in the country. He had to go back. And he was really, really, really broken up because he wanted to remain in that. But you know, Professor Rao, I went back, and as a result of my going back to India, I met this lovely lady who became my wife, and I started a technology company, and it's doing, you know, can busters, and I have to come back to America at least once a quarter because, you know, all my customers are in here, and I've never had it so good. Getting my visa turned down was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yes, I just had to share that with you because it's so relevant to the uh, anecdote that you just related. It works like that. We have mental chatter going on all the time in our head. The mental chatter has the ability to drag us to dark places which we do not want to go to. And the interesting point is we go to those dark places and we never figure out that we weren't dragged there. We allowed ourselves to go there because we were ignorant of the processes by which that happened. But once you become aware that there is this stuff called mental chatter which is going on inside your head, and mental chatter is mental chatter it is, you will get hijacked. You go turn on the news, read the headlines of the newspapers, and you will instantly be grabbed and taken to places. But if you recognize that this is happening, and if you are vigilant, and if you do the mental chatter exercise, which is, and I'm going to share that with you right now, which is you become aware of the fact that there is mental chatter. You don't allow it to carry, your, carry, it, uh, carry you off. You become a witness and observe it happening. And as you observe it happening, you'll find that it loses a great deal of its power. And you actually have the ability, which we'll get into a little bit later, to direct your mental chatter. So all of a sudden now, it is no longer an enemy. It is a conscious tool that you use to take you where you have predetermined you want to go. You know what Alan had you do earlier to write down your goals, your you know what you want to do in various areas of your life? That's freaking mental chatter. This time, you're using it constructively to shape your life. That's what I mean when I say your life isn't real. It's a construct. You made it. It's not something that exists out there that you have to grapple with. It is something that you made. In all likelihood, you made it unconsciously. You're now being given the ability to make it consciously and shape it the way you would like it to be, as opposed to something that you put together higgledy piggledy because you didn't know what you were doing. And the best part of it, as you grow and evolve, you will find that you're unhappy with what you created many times over. But now you have a tool. Whenever you become unhappy with it, you can tear down the pieces that you don't like and build it together again. And you can do this again and again. This is a rest of your life thing that you're going to be doing. And what Alan has just done is he's given you the tools with which you do that, and you're going to be using it, as I said, forever. Okay? Back to you, Alan. Any questions for Speaker Moore? By the way, the tougher the question, the better the answer. Yes. Matt? Yeah. Yes, sir. So I struggle with this tug of war in personalities where, you know, trying to suspend critical judgment from something that might appear bad, mm -hmm. um, but my critical judgment is really good, I mean, and, and, and trying to remain optimistic about something and, and, and suspending all judgment to let the good come in, mm -hmm. and it's constantly I'm going back and forth, and Correct. Um, as my partner will say, I tend to squash good ideas because my critical judgment kicks in and say, well, <laughs> yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, um, but those are all good points. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but if I'm, I, at the same time, I'm closing off the door of opportunity to let the good stuff come in. So 
it's this constant tug of war with it goes on within me. Very true. And I'm hoping you can give us some skills to. I've got to give my level of best back. Okay. So here's the deal. Most of the people in this room are compensated to make judgments. You know, look at Alan. You know, he's an estate planning and tax attorney, and whenever something comes up, he's got a judgment, and you know, here's a way to do it, or this right, or you've really blown it, and you're, you're going to jail, whatever. <laughs> he is paid for his ability to make judgments, okay? So there's nothing wrong with making judgments. What is wrong is not to be aware that you are making a judgment. So, when you say you make judgments and you're critical, don't try to stop yourself from because you've been conditioned to make that anyway and you can't avoid it. But become aware of the fact that you're making judgment. And when you become aware of the fact that you're making a judgment, you are also open to the possibility that maybe your judgment was not the best one. So, when you're consciously aware that what you're doing or what you're saying is not the fact. It wasn't handed down on tablets of stone by lightning striking from the sky. To say, hey, okay, this is a judgment and you know it might be wrong and I'm open to correction should you know should it be necessary. And you know in you know I have a judgment. I don't think it's a good idea, but you know, let's play around with the idea that my judgment is wrong. And if I play around with the idea that my judgment is wrong, what could be the benefit of indulging in that course of action? What could be the downside? Say, you know, I'm going to take a flyer and see what happens. Okay, and especially if there are people who are close to you who are arguing the other way, look at that and say, okay, I'm going to cut that person some slack. And even though I think it's a bad idea, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And who the hell knows? It might actually turn out to be a good idea. <laughs> and if in fact it turns out to be a bad idea, don't ever make the mistake of saying, I told you so. <laughs> Just say, okay, you know, next time around we'll do better. Look, you're going to go through life, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Don't think of them as you made mistakes. Think of it as a learned. You know, as when Thomas Edison said, you know, wasn't it awfully frustrating for you to have failed so many times? I said, I didn't fail so many times. He had something like 900 odd uh, materials he tried before he got the incandescent uh, filament right. And he said, I didn't fail, I just know 900 things that don't work. So treat that as you like. You know, life is a wonderful laboratory. And here, here is another thing. This is something we're going to go into later, but I'm just going to share it with you now anyway. What's your purpose in life? This is a really big one. So I'm certainly going to cover it tomorrow. I have another workshop tomorrow if any of you want to come. But maybe we'll cover it in a little bit in passing later on today. <coughs> We think we are here to build a career, to become famous, to amass a great deal of money, or whatever it is that is driving you on. And I'm inviting you to change that around. What you're really here in life, and the only thing you ever do is you work with yourself. All of the stuff that is given to you, you're in a critical situation, you're in a career, you have a family, <coughs> you're a parent, you're a spouse, all of these are tools that are given to you so that you can work on yourself. Some of these things you think are <laughs> trivial, like, you know, what should you have for dinner? And some of these things you think are, oh, this is really important. This is my career. This is my spouse. This is my child. But it's all grist for the milk. You're given what you are and the roles that you're playing, and they're all tools that are given to you to work on yourself. And if you use those tools skillfully, you will find that you grow. And if everything that is given to you is a tool by which you work on yourself, there is no such thing as failure. There is simply something that you've used and you have grown, and regardless of what the outer consequence or, or the outer effects are, it's, it's not a failure. It's something that you use to uh, grow and develop. So you cannot fail, period. Failure is a label. And once you adopt that label, you just go into an emotional dark space. You don't have to go there. You can learn not to go there. You can learn 
to learn what you need to from this thing that you would have called a failure and relabel it. And then all of a sudden you find that every day becomes the blast. Okay? All right? That's a hard act to beat. <laughs> so, page 40. Here's the good stuff in your life. Here's the bad stuff. Where do you put the bad stuff? You put it right there so you can't even see the good stuff. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty amazing. So, always bring a basketball in your glove compartment. <laughs> Hey, thank you very much for watching that. There's a lot more of that on YouTube. If you just search, go to YouTube, search Gassman, G-A-S-S-M-A-N, Rao, R-A-O, and you see um, some other things we've done. But a lot of you have asked, who is this guy? So his name is Srikumar, S-R-A-K-U-M-A-R, Rao, and a really good book by him, Are You Ready to Succeed? It is a tough book to get through. You could run through it or you could spend 100 hours in it easily. And then an easier book by Sri Kumar is about putting happiness to work, happiness at work. Again, Sri Kumar Rao, PhD. All right, thank you very much for spending part of your weekend with me. We're in the holiday season. I hope you're having a, a great, great Hanukkah. Tomorrow's your last day to send me a gift. And then after that, we've got all the way through Christmas. I hope you're having a great time with your family, great time with loved ones. Stay safe. And thank you again. See you next week.